All right, open your Bibles, please, to Acts chapter 28. Last lesson of the quarter, last chapter of Acts, Acts chapter 28. <clears throat> do appreciate your uh, endurance through the quarter. Those of you who will be teaching next quarter, I'm sure you'll do a great job. I know you've taken good notes and you've got your thoughts in order, how you want to present them to the children. So I appreciate all your hard work this quarter. And for the last time, let's go through our Acts Facts. We have the last one this morning. Quite a list. 20, 28 statements. All right, chapter 1. Ascension and appointment. Chapter 2. Pentecost and Peter's preaching. Chapter 3. Lame man and lesson. Second sermon. Chapter 4. Restraint, release, and request. The first jailing of the apostles. Chapter 5. Deception and Detention, Story of Ananias and Sapphira, and the Second Jailing of the Apostles. Chapter 6, The Servants Selected to Solve the Neglecting of the Grecian Widows. Chapter 7, Stephen Stone. Chapter 8, Gospel Going to Samaria, Outside Jerusalem for the First Time. Chapter 9, Saul Saved and Dorcas Delivered from Death, Peter Raised Her from the Dead. Chapter 10, Conversion of Cornelius, first Gentile to obey the gospel. Chapter 11, report and relief. Chapter 12, persecution, Peter and pride, the death of Herod at the end of that chapter. Chapter 13, Antioch to Iconium. Chapter 14 is the, of course, the reverse of that, the end of the first journey. Iconium back to Antioch. All right, chapter 15. Disagreement and decision. This is where the first quarter ended, and then we picked up here in this quarter for the remaining uh, 13 statements. All right, chapter 16, the Philippian prison, uh, conversion of the jailer. Chapter 17, addressing Athens, the Sermon on Mars Hill. Chapter 18, Achaia, Antioch, and Apollos, the ending of the second journey. Chapter 19, Rebaptism of the Twelve, uh, the Repentance, the Burning of the Books, and then the Riot in Ephesus. Chapter 20, Macedonia and Miletus, the coming around of Asia Minor toward the end of the third journey. Paul met the Ephesians in Miletus. Chapter 21, Jerusalem and Jewish mob. Paul finally gets to Jerusalem and the mob scene. All right, then keep in mind 22 and 26 are similar. So 22, review and rejection. The Jerusalem mob uh, rejected what he said, and that led then to the 23rd statement, which was, where did Paul have to go? The council. He appeared before the council, and then there was that conspiracy to take his life. All right, then 24. In confinement. He's in jail for two years. In chapter 25, he makes his appeal, and Agrippa comes on the scene, Herod Agrippa II, with his sister, uh, Bernice. So that gets to chapter 26, which is like 22. Paul tells his story again, so it's review, and then there's ridicule this time. So, uh, Festus says, much learning has made thee mad. You're, you're crazy. Well, the last two chapters, we started this past Wednesday, chapter 27. He's shipwrecked or marooned on Malta, and then today's will be he's rescued to Rome. All right. Very good. That's the list. This is a map that we showed this past Wednesday, and we've divided it up into, into sections, if you will. So we talked about this section first, and we went to Malta over here. Now we're going to be over here in, in Rome uh, today when he actually finishes the journey. So um, we just made the mention that as, the, as that infamous crow flies from Caesarea, which is where they were in the Palestine area, Syria, to Malta, was quite a distance away. And it was quite a journey, them getting shipwrecked as 27 comes to an end. We got them 
uh, brought safely to land. That's the last phrase in chapter 27. So let's look at a few points before we return to that last section of the map. So the journey to Rome will end in this chapter. They stayed three months on Malta. Uh, that was, of course, the, the winter, if you will, and that would bring about more favorable travel conditions, uh, obviously, in the, in the spring, for Paul to complete his journey to Rome. And when he finally arrives in what I'm calling the capital of the world, because at this time Rome was, that was the place to be, the capital of the, of the, uh, of the empire, that would fulfill his plans. Luke had written back in Acts 19 and verse 21 that Paul planned to go to Rome. And he also wrote the Roman Christians in, the, in that letter that I have been, I've been trying to come to you, but I've been hindered. So the plans had always been there, but he just never could get it worked out. So those were Paul's plans. And of course, as Jesus had already told Paul in Acts 23, you're going to witness for me at Rome. So Paul is going to finally get to Rome in this chapter. Again, not as he originally thought or hoped as a free man. He's, going, he's a prisoner, but he's still going to be in Rome. So that will fulfill these plans. And Luke's ending of his second treatise, of course, the gospel being his first account or treatise, and this is his second one, it sets up Paul's first imprisonment work, and he writes more letters. How many does he write in the first Roman imprisonment? How many letters? Four. What are they? Philippians is one. Colossians. Philemon. And Ephesians. Remember, Ephesians and Colossians, they're what we call sometimes the twin epistles because there's very similar language in both letters. So, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon, and these three right here, I personally believe we're all carried together because Tychicus was involved in carrying this letter and this letter and where was Philemon, where did Philemon live? He lived in Colossae. Of course, he had that slave Onesimus who ran away that Paul converted. So these will happen while he's here in this two-year Roman imprisonment. So it's not that Paul's just sitting around doing nothing. <laughs> he's going to be inspired to write more epistles. And just skip, skipping way ahead, will he be released from this imprisonment? Yes, he will. And he'll die in his second imprisonment sometime later. That's, of course, way outside the book of Acts. But just to kind of give it a full circle view, if you will. So Paul will still be working for the Lord, even though he's in a Roman prison. All right. Now, that being said, <clears throat> let's get to the text. Now, the first 10 verses of Acts 28 and see what Luke records for us. So all the crew, the passengers, all the ones aboard this ship, they made it safely to land. Uh, they encountered natives. Were these bloodthirsty natives? <laughs> how, does Luke, how does Luke describe them? What did they do? Very, very courteous, uh, very unusual, as Cheryl said, unusually kind to total strangers who just kind of hopped off this ship and swam to shore, got to shore as best as they could. And in fact, they even built them a fire. It was cold. It, they were damp and wet, if you will. And so Paul sees fit to gather sticks, to help to gather sticks for the fire. Well, that's not unusual for this to happen. Not that I'm a snake expert, but it's Paul gathering sticks. What happens? A viper, which is a poisonous snake, not a gardener snake. It's a viper, latches onto Paul's hand. Snakes tend to hide in sticks, and so Paul gather sticks and there's the snake on his hand or his hand or it looks like his hand or his arm uh, his hand the end of verse 3 so that is of course seen by everyone and what do the natives assume now these are pagans they're uneducated natives they have their own way of life and looking at things so what did they assume to them which would have been naturally because that's that, that was their mode of thinking Yes, the, the, the prevailing thought in ancient cultures were that if you did something wrong, you're going to suffer. The, the Bible even has examples of that, even, even in the, the days of Jesus. Uh, recall one time the apostles asked Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So that was just the, that was just the thought. So they assumed, well, Paul has been, uh, he's been saved from the justice, or he's been saved by justice from the sea. 
but you can't outrun justice. So now it's caught up with him, and now he's, he's obviously an escaped criminal. So they just start watching him. Well, what does Paul do with this snake lashed onto his hand? We have a snake uh, story in our family. Our son, youngest son was uh, bitten by a copperhead, and so he just shook the snake off his leg. That's what, that's what he told us. And so Paul just, you know, shoes or flings the snake off his hand, and then all eyes are on him because what are the natives looking for? As, as Luke writes the story. He's going to swell up. He's, going to, he's just going to drop over dead. And then, see, that's justice now. You can't outrun justice. So they're just watching, Paul, but what happens? Nothing. He just, nothing ever happens. So, continuing their superstition, well, now they've got to change their thinking. So now what do they assume? He's a god. He's not a man, he's a god, because no man can, can survive this. Let me pause here just for a moment. And I've often wondered this. Go back to Mark chapter 16. We're going to look at a couple of verses. I'm not saying this is so. I'm just giving you some food for thought. When Jesus gives the Great Commission in Mark's account, very familiar verses, verses 15 and 16, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved or not believed shall be condemned. Now look at verse 17 and 18. And these signs will accompany those who have believed. Now I'm going to stop right there. This doesn't mean that everyone who ever obeys the gospel will have these signs applied to him or her or them. That's not what Jesus is saying. I believe he's talking about in the overall nature, these would the, be the signs that would, that would confirm those who believed in the gospel in the process of revelation being done. But we live on the other side of that. Now, revelation has been complete for us. We have the completed word. But in the process of it being done, in the, in, in the course of books being revealed to chosen messengers, as we've stressed numerous times in this class, the purpose of signs and wonders and miracles was to confirm the word as is being preached, which is verse 20 in this chapter. But 17 and 18, Jesus said, These signs will accompany those who have believed. In my name they will cast out demons. That happens in the New Testament days. They will speak with new tongues. That's happened in the New Testament days. They will pick up serpents. Now, did Paul pick up a serpent? I mean, you ever heard of snake handlers? You know where, where they get that thinking? This verse here. Jesus is not encouraging people to willingly go pick up a snake. That's not what he's saying. But it would be a sign that you have a measure of the Holy Spirit, which Paul did, of course. They will pick up serpents, and if they drink any deadly poison, it shall not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, they will recover. So in this process of confirming revelation, this was one of the things that could happen just in the natural course of events. Well, it happened here to Paul. Paul didn't go looking for a snake. It just happened. But why wasn't he um, uh, killed because of the snake bite? I believe this passage back in Mark 16 sort of governs that activity. Uh, he, was a, he had a measure of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said that would be a sign that would accompany this process of salvation as it went through humanity to present day. Now, I'm not saying that happens present day because we have other verses that tell us that that kind of work is no longer needed. And that's outside the passage in Luke and in Acts, but we kind of put the whole thing together, okay? That's, that's where I'm going with this. So I believe uh, Acts 28 is an example, this passage here is an example of what Jesus talked about in Mark 16. That's, that's my personal belief. So after a long time of Paul showing no effects, the pagans, they switched their assumptions and they said, oh, he's a god, he's deity. That's why he's not dropping over dead. So that being the case, then that led to the next course of events here on the island. What's, what does Luke describe next in verses 7 through 9? Paul's not a god, but he's an apostle. What's he able to do? He can heal. He can work, he, he can work these sides. Again, the very things Jesus just spoke about back in Mark 16. Who does Luke mention specifically? In, in, in this account. He mentions somebody by name. Publius or Publius, however you say his name, who was he? He's the head of the island, he's the governor, he's the, he's the law, he's the official, whatever. And he's there, he lives there of course. 
And he had a father. What was his father's condition? He was sick. My version says with recurrent fever. Did yours have the word recurrent? It's a sick of a fever and dysentery. Okay, the dysentery. The, the fever wasn't just like a... It, it was apparently ongoing. He could not get made well. He just was all the time in this bad state of health. Well, lucky for him, Paul. <laughs> Not luck, because it wasn't luck, it was providence. But good for him that Paul's there. What does Paul do? He heals him. It's like that. Which led way to what else happening? That's Luke writes. They just like line up. <laughs> Paul, has a, Paul has a wedding area now, and the people are just coming to him. And he's healing, again, as, as Luke states it. In verse uh, 9, after all this had happened, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases were coming to him and getting cured. Um, Malta is, best I remember, Malta is 18 miles long and 8 miles wide. A little bitty patch of land. Give us some perspective. If you were to draw a straight line from downtown Athens to downtown Madison... That's 18 miles. That's how long the island was. We can drive that in how long? If you could drive such a straight line, probably 20 minutes, less than 20 minutes. Eight miles wide. The exit out here off I-65, what I always call the high school exit, exit 354, eight miles up the interstate, it's the Elkmont exit, plus one more mile. That's as wide as it was. Small patch of land. It wasn't like a big continent. So how many were on the island? We don't know. But as Luke says, all the rest who lived there who had either themselves or family members, loved ones, kinfolk who had some kind of illness or disease, again, I think they just lined up and they, they all came to Paul. Here's this God. He wasn't a God. He was just an apostle, but he had the power to heal. And he exercised that Holy Spirit ability here on the island. And so these things to me are dominoes that fall into effect. So Paul doing that, what is recorded for us in verse 10? Why, why would verse 10 be so appropriate? Well, they threw everything they did. So but on the part of the, those who lived on the island, you think they, they'd have been very grateful with what Paul just did? I think so. So they showed them again more acts of kindness. Now, as Cheryl points out, they had nothing. The, the ship is gone. They had no belongings. But even if they had those, I think they still would have showed gratitude for what Paul had just done for all these people on the island, curing their illnesses, healing them, so forth and so on. So no doubt out of gratitude for Paul's healing efforts, and they gave them whatever they needed for the voyage. And that sets him off now, at the end, at the end of this three months on Malta, to finish the journey to Rome. All right, so let's go back to our map. Now this is the, this is the far western section of the map that we haven't gotten to yet. So again, here is this tiny spit of land called Malta not much of it there and that's where they are and now the journey will resume we are starting now in verse 11 at the end of three months we set sail on an Alexandrian ship so another Alexandrian ship that's what they had when they got there was that a ship from that distance or that uh, port and it had wintered at the island and we just asked by comment that it had the twin brothers these were the sons of Zeus uh, the figureheads on the on the ship, just for historical point. After we put in at Syracuse, so they've left Malta, and they put in at Syracuse, which is on the island of Sicily, well-known island to the southwest of, of uh, Italy. So now they're at Syracuse. And then he says, we stayed there for three days. And from there we sailed around and arrived at Regium. So now they're going to pass through this strait here. There's a strait between Italy and Sicily. They don't go around. They just kind of go through that passageway, if you will. And they arrive at Regium, right there. I'm making too many marks here. That's, that's where they are now. And then Luke says, And a day later, a south wind sprang up. Now, I get the idea the winds are not as fierce here <laughs> as they were in the open sea because of land mass now will give them some protection, some, some ease of uh, better sailing. So they call a south wind. They're on the west side of Italy, the, the country of Italy. South wind sprang up, and the second day we came to where? Puteoli. That even sounds Italian, doesn't it? Interesting fact I learned this past Wednesday night. I talked to Lorenzo after church. 
after the assembly was over. I said, help me pronounce this name right. Not I'm not Italian, but I think that was close enough. But here's what he said, and to, to me this is fascinating. He said, there are still brethren who meet at Puteoli. To this day. Now does that mean they've always met from this day till now? I don't know. But look what Luke writes at the end of verse 13. There's the name Puteoli. Verse 14. There we found some brethren. There were brethren there that day. And there's still brethren who meet and worship the Lord in the New Testament fashion like we do today. I think that's cool. I think that's just really awesome. I hope there's ever been a break in the existence of the Lord's church there. That would just be phenomenal this many years later. So brethren were there then, brethren are there today. So continuing on, he says, we found some brethren and we were invited to stay with them for seven days and thus we came to Rome. What do you think happened in the course of those seven days? We don't know what day of the week they arrived, but they stayed there a week. What, what would Paul have done? I think they would have broken bread together. Like back in Acts chapter 20, when they came to Troas. purpose for them staying was to break bread. So they've come from Puteoli, and now he says we're going to arrive at Rome. Now something else I want to mention is here in verse 15. Something else Lorenzo told me. Let me erase my scribble there. And the brethren, when they heard about us, came from there, that is from Rome, as far as the market of Appius, or the Appii Forum, and three inns, or three taverns. Does this, does this name uh, Appii sound familiar? You know anything about your Roman history? Is there a famous road, the Appian Way? I asked Lorenzo what this was. He said, well, the best way to understand the market of Appius or the Appii form, how does the New King James render that? Okay, Appii form. He says, it's kind of like the Athens farmer's market down on, off Main Street in town. It's just, a, it's just a marketplace. It's like a forum, all right? Best that we can tell, and I've got a marginal reference in my Bible, the Appii market was 43 miles from Rome. So, from here to here is 43 miles, and from here, three ends to Rome is 33 miles. And Luke says that on their way, when they're coming to Rome, they came to Rome from these two places. So brethren were willing to travel, to walk, 43 miles or 33 miles, and then have to go back home. So, pretend that you're one of these saints that lives in one of these two places up here. Would you walk that far to see the Apostle Paul? Well, I would. Get to talk to him and, and see him? Had Paul ever been to Italy before? No. But they'd heard about him. His, his name has gone everywhere. His work has gone everywhere. And I'm just pointing out the fact, just simple human nature. Here was such a great giant, if you will, a spiritual giant for New Testament Christians, when the news were spreading, hey, Paul is in Rome. Let's go see him. Let's go talk to him. Let's go hear him talk. I'd, I'd walk a hundred miles to hear an apostle, wouldn't you? To get to talk with him and to hear him. Maybe hear him teach something from the Lord. I just think that's just great, a great human nature sort of story about this. They were willing to come, as Luke says, as far away as that. They came to meet us, verse 15, and when Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. Their trip, now think about it now, their, their willingness to travel encouraged an apostle because they wanted to be with him and to meet him. Don't ever, don't ever think that an apostle can't receive courage because Luke says that he did. Paul took courage in that. And that says a lot. That really says a lot. So now Paul is finally, he's finally in Rome. He's got there. And that ends our work with the, with the map. So that took us from Malta, the island, up to Rome, verses 11 through 15. All right, we'll spend the rest of our time now on these charts with these points. So Paul was in Rome for the duration of the chapter. 
starting in verse 16. So when we entered Rome, what were Paul's housing arrangements? Was he in a, was he in a cell? Doesn't appear that he was. Let's, let's link verse 16 to verse 30. Drop ahead just for the moment. Paul was able to rent his own quarters. Uh, some have likened this to an idea like maybe house arrest. I don't know if that's an accurate description or not, but it's not a jail cell like he had in Philippi or being forced into the barracks like he was in Jerusalem by the Roman uh, battalion. The, the uh, soldiers had to uh, house him, if you will, for his safety and confine him. So except for the soldier who was guarding him, Luke says in verse 16, Paul was allowed to stay by himself. That's, that's quite a benefit, if you ask me. And then verses 17 through the first part of verse 23, Paul has his first meeting with the Jews who are in Rome. So after three more days, he calls together those who were the leading men of the Jews. And when they had come, he began to say to them, here's the things he was saying, starting in the part of verse 17. Brethren, I thought, or though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. And when they had examined me, they were willing to release me because there was no ground for putting me to death. So you go back to Felix and after him Festus. What was their conclusion amongst all that? hoopla that Paul was in the middle of in Jerusalem. We're going to set this man free. He's done nothing deserving of death. He's done nothing deserving of confinement or imprisonment. Going back to the end of verse, uh, the end of chapter 26, what did, what, did, what did Agrippa say when he and Bernice and Festus were talking? This man has not done anything worthy of death or imprisonment. So he really should have been set free. And Paul just simply restates that here. There was no ground to hold me or put me to death, but when the Jews objected, which they did loudly and forcefully, Paul says, I was forced to do what? I had to appeal to Caesar. That, that was my civil right as a Roman citizen, and that's what's got me from there to here. That's why I'm here. So he just tells them. Those are the, those are the basic facts as they're laid out in the case. So verse 20 uh, for this reason, therefore, I requested to see you and to speak with you, for I am wearing this chain for the sake of the hope of Israel. Again, that's what Paul's been saying all along. He said that in front of the council. I'm on trial for the hope of the resurrection, which these, these, these men, they share that hope since they're my, my national kinsmen. They weren't Christians, but they, but they were, should have known about the hope that's found in the, God, or in the, uh, in the, in the scripture, mainly the prophets. So Paul repeats that again. So that's what he says to the Jews. Now, what was their response? What did they say? Verse, uh, verse 21. What's the first thing they said? We haven't heard any of this. Now, again, we don't know how fast news traveled in the first century, but it did travel. Word eventually gets around. It always has in any culture. No phones, no emails. Uh, we haven't heard of anything about what you've told us. We have received no letters from Judea concerning you. Nor have any of the brethren come here and told us about all this. But we do know one thing. What they say? We do know something. Verse 22. What do they know about? This thing called the The sect. We've heard about that now. It is spoken of against everywhere. And we want to hear your views on that. So somehow they knew Paul was wrapped up in that. They did know that. But I don't think they fully knew what his role in it was. So we want a second meeting. We want you to describe for us what, what this is all about. And the role you play in this. So that's how that first meeting ended. So they set a day to come back and where he was staying, and just tell us your story. Now, did Paul go through his conversion again? Luke doesn't say. 
Would you be surprised if he did? I wouldn't. I could see Paul going through that, talking about his past, talking about the fact that he first was an opponent to the gospel, that he was in line with these hardline Jews who were trying to stop the gospel. I could see Paul telling that story again like he had in 22 and in 26. But he's going he's gonna to tell them whatever it is that they would like to know. So the end of this interaction, if you will, the uh, uh, middle part of verse 23 through verse 29, here's his second meeting. They came to him in his lodging, and my version says in large numbers. Does yours say that? It wasn't a little small group. Everywhere there's been a need to have some kind of a, I don't want to say a discussion, but there's the need to have people exposed to what's being talked about. Usually more times than not, as we've seen in the book of Acts, there have been large numbers. A crowd has gathered. So they've come to Paul. No doubt they're interested in hearing what he's got to say. So large numbers. And he was explaining to them by solemnly testifying about what? The kingdom. When we started this quarter, well, these studies last quarter, we we're calling this Thy Kingdom Come. We've been focusing on the fact that the kingdom was the focus of the preaching of the gospel. The kingdom finally came in Acts chapter 2 when the church began. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Both Jesus preached and John preached. So as we wrap up our studies, isn't it ironic? And I don't think it's ironic. I think it's, I think it's divine providence. We end where we started. Paul is talking about the kingdom. The prophetic kingdom. Would these Jews have known about the prophetic kingdom? Yes. If they knew the scripture. Talk about Isaiah and Micah and Jeremiah and all the other prophets who spoke about it in some way, form, or fashion. That wouldn't be strange to them. They would know exactly what Paul is saying. Now, knowing it is one thing and believing it and, and obeying the gospel is another matter. But Paul was discussing the kingdom of God, trying to persuade them concerning Jesus. What did Paul use as his tools of persuasion based on verse 23? The law and the prophets. The law and the prophets. What Moses wrote, the Pentateuch, and all the prophetic writings. How long did this discussion take place? All day. Sitting there listening to Paul from morning to evening. Just go through. And I would, I would, in my mind, I can see Paul just methodically going through the passages. The law and what Moses wrote. And then what the prophets said about the coming of the Messiah and then the kingdom. And Paul just going through this rather calmly, rather methodically, but rather forcefully. And he gets done it'd be hard to argue against what Paul had just presented. He tried to persuade them. Even in jail, what's Paul trying to do? Persuade others. He's there, he's already said again, back in verse 18, I have no grounds to be sent here. I shouldn't even be in jail. Most people would spend all their waking time talking about what? Get me out of here. Me. I am being railroaded, I've been framed Blah, 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 blah. But not Paul. He's focused on the gospel. On telling the news about the kingdom. And he's trying his best to persuade them. Now verse 24. Did he have any success? Some. Luke writes that some were being persuaded. But others would not believe. So when they did not agree with one another, they began leaving. After Paul has spoken one parting word, verse 25 through 27, the Holy Spirit rightly spoke through Isaiah the prophet to your father, saying, Go to this people and say, You will keep on hearing, but will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull, and with their ears they scarcely hear, they have, and they have closed their eyes, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return that I should heal them. I've got on the chart here Matthew 13. This is a quotation from Isaiah chapter 6. Jesus was asked in Matthew 13, on the shore of Galilee, he told those seven parables by the sea that all dealt with, guess what? The kingdom of God. The disciples asked the question, why do you speak to them in parables? Jesus' answer was this passage, Isaiah chapter 6. And the point he made there, and the point that Paul's making here is, 
about those who were not seeing, those who left, they would not understand why. Sim one simple reason. They didn't want to. That's exactly right, Carla. They, hadn't, they weren't interested in it. If a person struggles with the parables, which I think are great, phenomenal teaching tools, I wish we studied them more. How come a person won't understand a parable? Simple reason. You don't want to. You've got to have the right kind of mind. You've got to have the right kind of thinking to understand spiritual truth. That's always been the case. That always will be the case. The gospel will do one of two things. It'll draw you in or it'll do what? It'll push you out. And Jesus makes no apologies for that. You've got to want to understand. You've got to want to learn it. That's the kind of person God wants in his kingdom. And so as they're leaving... I don't think Paul's not taking a personal dig at them. He's just saying, look, this is what the prophet said. And they would have known who Isaiah, who Isaiah was, most assuredly. And then after he, after he quotes the prophet, what does he say in verse 28? Let it be known to you, therefore, that this salvation of God has been sent to, one more time, the Gentiles. And they will listen. They'll hear it. You don't want to. But they'll, they'll latch on to it like it's their last breath. Any man should do that. Should latch on to the Lord's teaching like it was his last breath. Because that's really what it is. It's our only hope. And so they, the Jews departed. Meeting the meeting in a dispute. And that's, that's how Paul left that meeting. So Luke will close his second narrative. Or his, his second treatise narrative. With Paul being imprisoned for two years, again, verse 30 says he stayed in his own rented quarters, was welcoming all who came to him. Look at verse 31, one more time, preaching the kingdom, talking about the kingdom. He enjoyed some limited freedoms. He could receive visitors, preaching the kingdom uh, openly, unhindered. Did he have any success? Well, Acts doesn't say this, but again, in some of those prison letters, what do we know? Who do we know Paul reached? In Philippians, who did he reach? Some in Caesar's own household. He converted some. And how did he convert Onesimus? Well, that runaway slave. Somehow they met. Don't know what conditions it was. Doesn't matter. But through divine providence. And Paul asked back to Philemon. He says, perhaps, providence, perhaps even Paul didn't know. Perhaps this is why he was parted from you, that he might turn to you not just as your slave, I'm paraphrasing, but as your brother. Because he's come to the Lord. And so Paul could do all that while he's in prison. The lesson to us may be, well not may, I think it is. Um, even when we have tough times in life, we have down moments, we have moments when we're in the valley instead of the mountain peak. There's still things we can do. Uh, how they present themselves, that's up to God's providence. But we still need to find ways to be busy. Paul was. Even as Luke's story comes to an end. All right. That's the book of Acts. I hope you found it helpful. And I have great confidence in you who will be teaching next quarter. Make these stories come alive to your children. Review the Acts facts every class. I think it's just critically important. They get these things ingrained in their, in their memory. Um, even some of these small children who are in quarter one right now, through the 15th chapter that ends today, they're spitting these things out just like this. And again, children love memorization lists. They latch onto it so easily. So keep that going. I appreciate all your hard work and participation this quarter. Thank you so much.